I thought it would be a good opportunity to look at a, a couple of things here in retrospective manner. Let me ask you a question. Can we identify major things that have changed for us here at New Hope in the last two years? Think for a minute. And when you think of something that is major that has changed, that affects our spiritual lives, Nancy? Yes. Phyllis and Curtis have come. We had a very, very, very broken man who was coming to get help often. And one day, Curtis met him downtown at the bus station, and uh, he brought him over here, and Curtis dropped him off and had turned around in the street and was getting ready to leave when the Holy Spirit gave him unmistakable instruction. I said, go back and go in and meet the people. I actually saw Curtis back up down the street and pull in, and his head was down, and he had that, okay, I'm going kind of walk. And he came in, and he met me. And instantly, I felt this connection and this closeness. And over the discussions that has been um, executed over the last year and a half, two years, Curtis and I... Phyllis, Eileen, all of you. We come to find out we believe not only in the same God, in the same Jesus, and the same Holy Spirit, what, but we believe in the same tenets of faith, the same reasons for being a believer, the same purposes to come out of our lives. And even though they came from a church congregational culture quite a bit different than ours, the foundational elements are no different. And God impressed upon them to make this their home. And so they did. What else have we had change? We have invested time and a little bit of money in making sure our Indonesian renters stay here. Not because we don't want them to leave. If that's made to be their choice and their action, we're fine with that. But while they're here, these young people want to relate to the world around them through the same means their peers at college relate to it. And it requires some fancy stuff. Lights, sound equipment, video equipment. We're building a new table for the media back there in the back of the room. And in that table, the Indonesian church is going to put a full multi-camera digital editing suite in there. Because some of these kids are taking broadcast engineering and graphics arts. And they'll be able to experience where they're going to go in the workplace here. So you're right. The physical environment the things that we would not need, we'd probably not even think of them, they need. So we're helping them to reach where they need to be, but we're also investing in our own future with them as persistent renters. What else has changed? I didn't want her to get off on exit 72. I wanted her to get off on exit 73. And she took exit 69, got off early. She got off the path that I was thinking and went right straight to what the Holy Spirit has done. Look at what we have, what we are being given, and what is being shared with us through the people that we have here that we've come to love and that we have learned are friends that stick closer than a brother. We thank you for that, Diane. I think of a few things too. The last two winters, the shelter has had four people. Three of those four people could be in the Reach Out Men's or Women's Shelter 
and the shelter's not open for the first time in eight years this winter. But in place, someone who had need came and said, I've been told that you can help, and I'm not going to take no for an answer. And I said, well, you're right. You won't get no for an answer. So God gave us what we had prepared for over the last year, which is to help families and to look to that as a place where we will spend our time and effort helping. We've also made some new friends. We've known Miles and Catherine for a couple of years now, coming and going, visiting us on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and they become dear friends. What else has changed here? In the last six weeks, we've had 50 people every Tuesday. And we're doing more than 20 showers every Tuesday. We're now sitting at the point that the troll, whom we love, has said we might actually have to look at doing showers Tuesday and Wednesday. He has also said, wow, it's interesting. We're doing laundry on Tuesday and Wednesday, but look at we're getting more calls from families. And so we're changing how we relate to our community and in our community. Nancy. Imagine that. That's really cool news because the denomination to which we belong, Grace Communion International, is in a position of having to define the starting point for being a church and the ending point for being a church. Now, what that comes down to meaning is one thing right off the top. What's the magic number of people that move you from being a small group, a house fellowship, into being a church. And the discussion that's been passionately occurring for the majority of the last year is, well, we can't just stuff New Hope in a jar and say they're not a church because they don't have this many people and because of this and the other thing. And it came down to the point where our civil-mindedness, our willingness to share in our community and to do the work of sharing the gospel and meeting and, and helping people all in a spiritual-minded sense has been what is seen, not the tiny size of our group, the behavior. You know, for probably three years, every time I met somebody and we talked, on the first introduction, the response was, well, what do you guys do for outreach? And I'd tell them, and they'd tell me what they did. And it would always wind up with one or two things. Oh, it must be nice to have a great church with lots of people that can give uh, financially well to support that mission. 
and I'd let that go. And if it wasn't that remark, it was another one. Well, it must be great to have so many resources to call upon. And then I would say, well, you're right. It is awesome to be able to call upon the resources and to be able to uh, know and depend upon God's promise to fulfill what we're going to do. And what amazes me is God does it with 12, 14 people. And all of a sudden it's kind of, what? And it doesn't make sense for a minute. And for us, this is who we are. This is our DNA, which is basically what we are and how we do things around here. Uh, it's amazing to me that we have been given so much. An interesting point for uh, some of you that have not been with us a long time here. There was a time in 2005 when Pastor Steve had been in the renting model of this building and the property here. And it came down to the point where there was a phone call. Could you come to a board meeting, please, of our church, Steve? We were renters here. And Steve goes into the board meeting, and he's thinking, am I going to get sliced and diced or what? And he goes in, and there's a lot of sorrowful people sitting there. Very, very stern looks on their faces. And he gets asked, here, come over to me, I got something for you. And he goes over to Richard Stark, the president of the board, and he gives him the quit claim deed for this two and a half acres in the buildings without one penny changing hands. And he says, you guys are doing more and make it a bigger difference than we are. Here, it's your church, our pastor's retiring. And we're kind of in the downward slide and you're in the upward push. So the church is now yours. So we're here inviting people to come visit with us to hang out. We invite people to come and get basic needs in life met. We invite people to come and sometimes to hear worship, sometimes to participate in it. We're here to help people and we do it because we have been provided for so richly and given so much. A tiny little remnant kind of reminds me of a time when there was a handful of guys fighting and arguing over who was going to be in charge when Jesus died. And all of a sudden, Jesus corrected their understanding. And we went on to this two hands full of people becoming the ones who made the first cornerstone of the modern Christian church be created. They, they watched that cornerstone go into place and they built on it. So I want to ask you, when it comes to God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, what's most reassuring to you guys? Is it God's love or his power? Now remember, reassuring. What reassures us the most? His love for me. It, it was... It was his power until January 27th, uh, 2007, at about 4 a.m. when the lights went out and I was laying in the hospital dead. My wife's standing there looking at me with my best friend, and they're both going, I can't believe it. He died. Well, at that moment, afterwards, his power was clearly burned into my mind. And then it became obvious to me that his love was even more powerful than his power to affect the physical things around us. And that amazed me that I suddenly found that there was nothing else that I sought as deeply as I did his love. Yes? I, when we see it manifest, it is the same thing. But in our past, sometimes we changed things 
in how we perceive. You know, Paul said, uh, our separation is on our part. It's not God. Miles. Isn't it interesting that some of the poorest people on this earth give the most consistent offerings and tithes even compared to wealthy people? The percentages of their income are frequently higher for people who live poverty and live a very, very slim life financially. If there was one scripture that strengthened your faith, strengthened your resolve, and gave you hope for a day, what would it be? Dave, I already know you got something to say on this. Go ahead. Very simple. Mm -hmm. No, but the gist of it is, look to me and trust me, I have you. And that's what we have to learn to live within. Now, imagine years ago when our first day of living in faith came. For some of us, it might be some years back. It might be some months back. It might be 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. That first day we lived in faith compared to now, look at how much we have changed. Look at how much we have learned to depend. You know, Paul made a statement that flies in the face of conventional wisdom. You know, except for my weakness, uh, there would be no way that God's greatness and his power would be brought to be seen, but in my weakness, he's made strong. And therefore, I tell you, love him, receive from him. He's giving, and your job is to take and pick up and use. So we have that opportunity, and we have a persistent thing that we strive for in our lives, and that persistent thing is receiving love and giving love. Receiving what comes in and sharing what goes out so that others might receive it. Can prosperity weaken our faith? It shouldn't, sometimes it does.
you're implying something here that is very, very important. It is that through prosperity, going away from oneself, you receive value coming towards oneself. And it might be spiritual, it might be physical. Sometimes it might even be financial. And so what you're saying is dollar signs aren't the target nor the goal. And Jesus kind of pointed at that when he said, well, go sell everything you got and give this away, and then come on, let's go. Nancy. You know, we don't always enjoy some of the tests and trials we have. We don't always enjoy some of the hard times we have physically or financially. We don't always enjoy the hard times medically. But what is the one thing we should always be? Content with what God has given and put us in in that moment. Being content. Now, is that the same as having great joy? Not exactly. Is it the same as not caring? Woe is me. I'm going to go eat worms. That's, that's even sin. Yeah. Being content is being thankful in the relevancy or in the context of that moment, that day, that time in our life. Being content is really about receiving and accepting and then coming to understand. Sometimes understanding isn't immediate. Sometimes it comes after a time. So let me ask you this. What is your first reaction when I say are you a signs and wonders person? Are you a luck and chance kind of a person? What's the first thing that comes into your mind? Those don't equate. Those what? Don't equate. They don't equate? Are you really saying they don't belong next to each other being compared? Correct. Dave, once again, you took the exit before I was thinking you would. <laughs> Miles, what did you say there? Is there such a thing as luck? No. When the Lord has mercy upon you and you're not asking for it, but he graciously gives out of his abundance at a time that you don't expect it, the world would consider you luck. Okay. We know that we're just blessed. Amen. Diane. Time and chance. We can look at that a handful of ways. Hey, I was going down the road and I had no clue that guy was going to come around the corner and broadside me in the car. It was just time and chance. Time and chance. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. The rain's been falling. Time and chance. That leads me to our concluding statement in a minute. Miles?
still. What? No. No. They get to the other side. What happens? Everybody they left grabbed their buddies and met them over on the other side. Right? They ran around the lake. And then what happened? He had in that compassion, in that place of grief, he just lost his cousin. In that place of grief, he ministers to the multitudes. He had the feeding of 5,000. You have one of the greatest miracles that we look at in the natural that you can't do that. But yet, seen and proven that the little that God gives us is more than enough to feed and clothe the multitude who needs that. So in that place of grief and that place of compassion, when we let that out, it's like it releases something in the spiritual realm. I can't explain it, but I've seen broken bones healed in a prayer that I, the guy I wanted to pummel him because he was being such a jerk, but he said he knew You're talking about intentionality. No mishaps, no accidental whoopses or, oh, wow, look how that turned out. Intentionality. Intentionality. There was a fellow some years back who could go three years within the context of marriage. And then he would break out of the marriage and go philandering and find a girlfriend and he'd leave, leave his wife and eventually get married to this new lady. And about three years after they got settled down, he'd have his mind and heart break again and he'd go out philandering and get a new wife. Well, this happened multiple times. And it eventually led to the place where the guy committed suicide. But what was left after that suicide was three of the strongest women in an entire church in our denomination. And they would not have met God and been called to Christianity except for this ultramaroon who eventually killed himself from guilt and stress and anxiety and everything going wrong. He knew who he was. But even in his brokenness, he brought three people in that God wanted. Now I sit and think about that and I have to ask myself, is that legal or is that a foul? Because we think in terms of right or wrong. And it occurred to me, well, wait a minute, that was God's timing. And God did tell us, if you don't do what I ask, I can raise a rock. Remember, I already had Balaam's friend there talk for me once. I can do that again. We live in a time where provision is great, where opportunity is great. And in that time, we have the chance to be content and be helpful, be giving, be merciful. All kinds of other descriptions, which basically are the actions that should be taken when God gives you abundance and provision. In our times here talking about faith and trust and devotion and loyalty and godliness in the months to come, we're going to cover a lot of those areas and a lot of the details we talked about today. They're going to come out in the sense of looking deep into the Word. So even in the absence of Curtis and Phyllis today, They've blessed us because we got to have a free form, do what you want Sunday. We got to step away from the structured, not wrong, not bad, the good structured normal day and have a 
loose-fitting, relaxed, spirit-led day. And we got to do what was in our heart. But remember, through doing what we want and what God wants us to do, if it doesn't remember the plan, if it doesn't point to Jesus and the Holy Word, the gospel, if it doesn't tell the gospel story, and if it doesn't acknowledge the Holy Spirit, it's wrong. Now, what would you say if I told you there is no wrong way to preach the gospel if it acknowledges the plan of God, the Creator, Jesus, it points to Him and the truth, and it always acknowledges the Holy Spirit. Would you think that's a true statement? 